All photographers exist on this graph. I don't know why, but we do. You're either a sad sack or a weirdo, rich or poor. Now I'd like to clear something up because I workshopped this first and a lot of people thought that the origin here was normal middle class photographer and that is wrong. No photographers are normal. So the center is half sad sack, half weirdo. Now for the Y axis, I would say the baseline is like, are you, if you're making it as a photographer, you're getting by as a photographer. If you're living a middle class lifestyle as a photographer, I would argue that you're kind of rich. So for me personally, I, I was full sad sack, complete sad sack, uh, slightly poor, and my goal is to move to full on rich weirdo. So you can move on this. Uh, I plotted some of uh, our favorite photographers on here. So let's look at them and get into this because why not? It sounds fun to me. We're gonna start with one of my all time favorite photographers, Gary Winogrand, the great New York City street photographer. He was definitely born poor. His parents were immigrants. He was highly regarded. He was beloved by the other photographers, but you know, had three marriages, tax problems. And by the end of his career, he passed at the age of 56 from cancer. And for the last few years of his life, he'd just been compulsively taking photos and not even processing the film, looking at the images. That is not the sign of a healthy person. So Gary, I love you, but you're, you're pretty far down here. Now I wanna go to the one photographer who I feel like here maybe is a little more extreme, Ernest Cole. Um, did very important work documenting apartheid South Africa, his home country, and um, has some of the most insider view of a lot of what was going on there. Amazing work, very important. Came to the United States, documented um, Jim Crow South, urban black culture, and just did very spectacular work. But he was always destitute and again, cancer early, I think 49. Uh, very rough life for Ernest Cole, very important work. Okay, let's look at one of my early influences here as a photojournalist, Robert Kappa. Now Kappa is an interesting case because I think most photojournalists have that sad sack in them. He was getting by as a photographer, so I'm gonna put him, you know, he wasn't super poor, but he was making it. And I think a lot of photographers kind of cover up the sad, like you can't be a happy person and wanna document war. So if you're a war photographer, you are clearly in, in sad sack territory. So we're gonna put Kappa right there. Um, and now let's look at Ouija. Uh, Ouija was a news photographer in the 30s and 40s. He was at crime scenes. He was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So I don't know, what do we think about Ouija? He was an immigrant himself. He moved here in 1909 to America and photographing crime and all that, there's no way uh, he was like a super <laughs> happy go get them kind of person. It's someone selling images to tabloids in the 30s isn't making much money either. So we're going to put Ouija down here as well. Um, Helen Levitt started street photography in the late 1930s and did it all the way through until the late 80s, early 90s. Just an amazing photographer, great work. So we're going to put her, uh, you know, she never made a lot of money. Um, I don't think, I don't picture her as being like super sad either. So she's more central. All right, so now we're gonna look at Dorothea Lang. And I think, again, she's a little more in the middle. Um, she took very, I mean, her photos are on, on this end. I mean, they're all the way. Uh, the Great Depression, Japanese internment camps, the dismantling of a town uh, to build a dam. I mean, all of her stories were very sad, but all of the photographers loved her. She seemed like she was uh, happy despite some of that. So I'm gonna put her more central. Now, um, Slim Aarons here is one of the only people who moved quadrants significantly. Now to start, and this wasn't discovered until after he passed, his father abandoned the family, his mom uh, had mental health issues and spent some time away from the family. He was raised by relatives and uh, he was very, very tough situation growing up. Um, documenting World War II, uh, really tough stuff, tough images. So first half of Slim Aaron's here is going right there. Now, Mary Ellen Mark, documentary photographer, her content of her photos, teen runaways, asylums, like very heavy, heavy stuff. But she was a wonderful, delightful, um, upbeat, positive kind of person. 
So that brings her away back from the content here. And no documentary photographer is really going into the rich territory unless they started there, which I don't, I'm, I don't think she did. So we're going to put her more central right there. I'm not doing a lot of photographers that are still with us, but I got to put Bruce Gilden on there. Again, everyone who knows him personally says wonderful things about him being a delightful person. His style of photography, though, is very abrasive. And if anyone gets in his way on the street, uh, he'll tell him a thing or two. So he's, he's, and now I think a lot of times people mask uh, sadness with anger and uh, he had very difficult upbringing. And so I think he's very uh, sad sack area. I can't speak to his uh, financial situation, but we started, you know, in, in the poor uh, upbringing. Um, so I'm going to put him, you know, somewhere over here. Uh, Martin Chambi, a Peruvian indigenous photographer, um, very early 1900s. He is a documentary photographer. And like we've said, documentary photographers clearly go into the sad sack area. And he was born very poor. So we're going to put him somewhere around here. Vivian Meyer was highly requested for this. She was a nanny for her whole life. And... So nannies don't make a lot of money, but she was able to have enough money to be able to travel. Uh, she has photos from Europe, uh, New York, even though she was based in Chicago. And so I still think she probably didn't have very, well, she clearly didn't have very much because all of her images uh, were abandoned in a storage unit that was unpaid for. So, you know, poor. Now, some of her charges, the children found her delightful, but others, said that she could be very uh, short. So, I, and also I think the fact that she wasn't trying at all to have her photography seen or shown belies some other maybe kind of like darkness. So we're gonna put her uh, down in this area here. She's probably pretty close to Gary, somewhere around here. Nan Golden had a very tough upbringing, uh, foster care, just lots of hardship. Um, lots of poverty, and that's the kind of thing she continued to document throughout her career. So, um, you know, she found some notoriety and had some things published. And again, I don't think a lot of these photographers who started in this area moved out of this area, but maybe they were moved up a little bit. Great photographer, wonderful work. Now, finally, uh, a lot of people requested Annie Leibovitz. She's one that I think moves. I'm going to put her in this column. Some people thought she was weird. I don't think that she's weird. I can't say anything except for I just feel some sadness there. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of the sad sack. Just a tinge of the sad sack here. So I think she's over here. Now, she does charge and make a lot of money, but she's also had some very public financial issues. So uh, she's fluctuated up and down out of this area, but I'm gonna, we're going to keep her uh, in this area, maybe somewhere around right here. When I say rich weirdo photographer, who is the first person that comes to mind and why is it William Eggleston? So in this quadrant, it's clearly gonna be mostly art photographers because when you have a trust fund or an inheritance to back you up, you can do whatever you want without any worry of whether people are gonna like your art or not. Who cares? Be as weird as you wanna be, which brings us back to William Eggleston. So Eggleston here is... Um, you know, he grew up on a plantation <laughs> in the South. Um, as far as I know, he never had like a regular job. He was briefly a professor at Harvard in the 70s. I've never even heard of him taking commissions. I can't say that definitively, but he would just take the most random pictures, some of which I love and hold very dear, and other ones I don't really care for all that much. But uh, he was rich, very weird, now, you'd think that he would be the furthest point out from the origin on this graph, but you would be wrong unless you know of this gentleman, Carlos Relvas. <laughs> he is a Portuguese photographer in the late 19th century. He was like full-on weirdo. I mean, look at that face. He's clearly a weirdo. Extremely wealthy. He was basically like royal class. A good guy. He did a lot of things, founded children's hospitals, raised money for hurricane victims, uh, but he was a full-on weirdo, extremely rich. The furthest movement on this graph, only a few photographers I moved and had uh, different stages of their career, Slim Aarons. He grew up extremely poor, doing war photography, 
which we've covered is very uh, sad sack job. Uh, but after that, he said, I've had enough of this. I'm going to live the good life. And he did. He traveled the world uh, documenting the wealthiest people, like the 1% of the 1%. Uh, I don't know how much money he had personally, but he lived like he was very well off. Uh, and so it also takes some audacity to be like, hey, I'm making this huge change. I admire this. And honestly, the uh, poor sad sack to rich weirdo uh, trajectory is where I'm headed. So uh, good on you, Slim Aarons. Anne Geddes. If you grew up in the 90s, you saw her photos everywhere. Calendars, flower pot babies. That's weird. It's, it's so weird. It's weird. So full, full weirdo. Uh, I think she probably made some good money. I don't know where she started out at, but she ended, out, uh, ended up pretty high here. Uh, let's go with someone you might not think would be in the weirdo category. We're going to talk about Mr. Gordon Parks. Now, he's very, very close to the middle. Uh, typically, photojournalists are in the sad sack area, but he... Uh, Jess was a great dude, and he covered some hard stuff, but he also helped a lot of people out. Um, he made a pretty good living, from what I could tell. And uh, so we're putting him here, just over the line, because uh, it's a little bit weird to be a documentary photographer and not be a sad sack. So we're going to put Gordon Parks right here. And this is probably slightly above middle class. I think he did well for himself. He also directed Shaft, so that's that also helps move... Filmmakers move more into that weirdo category. So that's where we're going to put Gordon Parks. Now, another person who moved on this, uh, we haven't covered his origin, but he's uh, definitely a rich weirdo later in his career. This is no judgment on the what his photos were about, but he was purposefully trying to be as shocking as he could be. So that is full weirdo. Um, I appreciate him and what he did. Uh, and so uh, he, a lot of the reason he became able to move to Rich was because of uh, a relationship he had with Sam Wagstaff, who was a very rich person who, who bought Maplethorpe a studio, uh, his first medium format camera. So he's, uh, again, very, okay, so he's, he's, okay. Maplethorpe is more weird than babies and flower pots. So we're, well, let's dial it back a little bit here. All right, let's go here. We can make adjustments on the fly. We haven't gotten to her yet. Um, all right, now, very odd photos. Uh, Ralph Eugene Meat Yard, love his work. But he was a very, like, ordinary person. Uh, he was um, upper middle class, uh, had a, he was an ophthalmologist, I believe. Uh, so he's not personally as weird as his images seem. So his personality brings it back. He was like Zen Buddhist uh, practice, like cool dude. So I'd put him about in the middle of the quadrant. He did pretty well for himself. Now, uh, Dido Moriyama. I don't really know much about his upbringing, what kind of class he came from. Um, he's done well in the art world. People know him. People love his work. I doubt he's very wealthy, but I think he does pretty well. His work is uh, very cool, very edgy, uh, going into that weirdo territory. So let's put him here. Um, who else do we have? Inga Morath, we have not talked about. Um, she had an amazing life. I made a mu must-know photographer video about her. You can watch it if you want to know her whole story. Um, again, as a journalist, you'd think she'd be in the sad sack, but she just did too many cool things. Um, so she's going into the weirdo. She made a good living at photography. She also married uh, Arthur Miller. So uh, I think they both together did pretty well for themselves. So I'm going to put her about there. Now, Cindy Sherman, uh, in this moment, I'm not remembering where she came from. I'm, I'm fairly certain she came from a little bit of wealth in the beginning. And if she wasn't already wealthy, she her photos sell for millions. And she's uh, still alive to collect those millions. So uh, pretty pretty well off. And uh, it is pretty weird to primarily take photos of yourself throughout your career. So let's put her here. Um, let's see who else we've got. Eiko Yamazawa, uh, Japanese photographer, early 20th century, uh, very rich background. Um, she did a lot of abstract stuff, 
equal person. Adra Cowens, um, middle class from beginning all the way through, I believe. Uh, and he's got some documentary to him, but again, good guy. Uh, cool dude, great work, love him. Ming Smith, uh, again, just, just into this quadrant here. And uh, finally, Stephen Shore, it's weird to set up a large format camera on the street corner and just document factual images as art, especially at the time. I mean, he started that. He was one of the only people doing that sort of thing at the time. So, um, you know, he's an artist and a professor, so I don't, I wouldn't put him into rich territory. Probably somewhere here. There we go. So that is our uh, rich weirdo. Oh, I forgot about Lars Thunbjörk. Um, not rich. A documentary photographer by nature, but his images are very cool and quirky and very interesting. So we're going to put him right there. Love him. Wanted to get him on there too. The poor weirdo is not an enviable position to be in as a photographer because either the, the oddness of your work or your personality is putting you in a place that can make it hard to be uh, marketable and make an income. Let me be clear, I have a great respect for weirdness and this is not looking down on anybody in any way. I personally strive to be more weird in what I do. So let's dig right in here and uh, let's start right at the top. We've got this photographer here, Jessie Tarbox Beals. Now she is a photojournalist, which we've covered are typically in the sad sack category, but she was a pioneer. She was widely regarded as the first woman photojournalist. And um, she struggled throughout her career to make ends meet. So that brings her down. She did make money at some points, but by the end of her life, she was uh, way down here. And she did night photography, which was not something that really many people did in her era, let alone women. So she's got some good uh, positive weirdo vibes going on here. Um, let's talk about Robert Frank, who is kind of a street and documentary photographer. Again, usually more in the sad sack, but I don't feel that way about him. His work really um, is just a deep look at America in the mid-1950s and just all of the, the good and the bad and the everything that was going on in that time. So really, I put uh, Robert Frank just kind of more... Uh, Slightly weird. I don't think he really made a lot of money. He didn't come for money either. So we're going to go with that. Uh, definitely one of the weirdest photographers right here, Joel Peter Witkin. I cannot show you a lot of his photos because they involve uh, cadaver parts and things like that. So he's full, full on weirdo. Again, I, I'm pretty sure he didn't come from a rich background and I don't know how much his art sells for. So we're going to put him kind of right up in this corner here. Um, James Luna is, uh, James Luna was a really cool dude. Um, he did photography and performance art. One of my favorite pieces involved him uh, lying on display in a museum as an indigenous person. Uh, so he was full on weirdo. He had uh, Take a Picture with an Indian was another series that he did. That's his title. Um, again, Art photographers, I think he was a professor for a long time, so not broke, pretty weird, not as weird as Witkin, so we're going to put him right around here. Um, Man Ray. Man Ray did some really wild photography techniques in the early 20th century, uh, lots of experimental stuff. Um, so with this strong of a baseline here with him, we, we got to pull pretty far back right away, so... Uh, again, I don't know. I, he didn't come from money. I don't, I doubt that he made much. So we're going to put him somewhere around here. Uh, Katrine Loire, the French photojournalist. Again, photojournalist, usually in the sad sack. She comes over into the weirdo side uh, for things like a, just a really positive attitude, positive person. It's weird to witness so much destruction and be like a nice person to be around. So we're going to put her into here. Additionally, uh, on break from Vietnam, she was hired to photograph Woodstock and she just bailed after like a day and just partied with everybody. So um, she is definitely in the weirdo category. Maybe a little bit more than Frank. We'll put her there. 
uh, Malik Sidibe, uh, an African photographer, um, cool dude, happy, uh, just would often give his photos away for free. Uh, people, foreigners who would visit him in his studio, he'd just give them negatives, not even prints. He'd hand out negatives and stuff. Uh, so he was happy, very happy, uh, did not have a problem with his uh, financial station in life. And his stuff is quirky, fun, interesting. So uh, because it's not sad, it is weird. So we're going with that. Now, Jacob Rees is another photojournalist who crossed over to Weirdo because he, um, the Flash was a brand new invention. He would go into these tenements in New York City and not announce himself, just walk in with this big old camera and shoot off a bright flash capturing these images because he wanted to document the tenements and the living conditions to try to help the people because he used to live in a tenement when he first came to America. So he started out very poor. I'm sure he was okay uh, later on in his life, but he still had you know that mentality of one of those were his people and he wanted to help them. Uh, so we're gonna put him right here. Now, Robert Maplethorpe, we covered him in the last video as a rich weirdo, but he started out as a poor weirdo. Um, he became more weird. And again, just to reiterate, uh, it's not the content of his photo. He was trying to shock. He was trying to be uh, provocative. So um, it has nothing to do with uh, his uh, sexuality that makes him a weirdo. It's the way that he lived his life and just was always taking nude photos of himself. Um, and uh, before he met his uh, financial benefactor, he was definitely in the poor weirdo category. And he got weirder than he was early. So early Maplethorpe, I'm gonna put like probably here. I almost forgot to talk about Tichi, the weirdest and poorest of all the photographers. He would make his own cameras, as you can see here. He was uh, a dissident against the government. Uh, he was abused. Um, he was widely regarded in his town as an eccentric, and everybody just kind of tolerated him. Uh, he would wander around and basically take photos of women from a distance um, at the public pool, through the fence, sunbathing in the park. Um, so he became this kind of like known as an outsider artist. Um, this stuff obviously is a little sensitive subject-wise, but um, he got some recognition later in his life. The townspeople knew what he was up to, and they just kind of tolerated it. Um, he was extremely poor, uh, just a very unique person. So he is the far point. I mean, to put it here would be, I mean, it, he really should be out here. Um, he'd, he'd make these frames. He'd take like 90 photos a day, like every day, uh, with his homemade cameras and lenses, and he would make these frames for them so they became part of the art. Uh, he was celebrated near the end of his life, but he mostly took photos between the 60s and 80s. So there's Miroslav Tihi. The rich sad sack photographer elicits very little empathy from people on the surface. We tend not to feel bad for people who are sad who have a lot of money. But I think something that we get from these photographers is that they use their position of privilege instead of going the weirdo direction and being typically very self-indulgent, they want to use their resources to do good. They want to do uh, photojournalism, documentary photography, maybe help out disadvantaged folk. I'm gonna start by talking about one of the most wealthy photographers before he even started, French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, the godfather of modern street photography. Now, one uh, thing I need to say about this is that this baseline down here of rich is not middle class. It's just getting by as a photographer. So if you're making it, if you're, if you're getting jobs, you're doing okay, uh, you, you're at least getting some bills paid, like you're, you're rich as a photographer. Middle class falls more up here. Now, Cartier Brisson, extremely wealthy. Um, and as I've said, any photographer that tends to do this sort of documentary, street, photojournalism, tends to go more on the sad sack side of things. But um, he did a lot of work to lift up photography as a medium. Uh, he wasn't 
uh, completely self-focused, uh, and a lot of he did a lot of good for a lot of people. So he's less of a sad sack, but still, you know, documentary photographer falls into that. So very rich. We'll put him right about here. Uh, another person, also quite wealthy, is uh, Sebastio Salgado. Now, same deal, documentary photographer photographing very uh, tough, hard things. Um, but again, you know, he's working to bring people's story to light. Uh, he always has a positive attitude when I hear his quotes and in interviews and things like that. Again, so I think he pulls away from the kind of pit of despair. And we'll put him, I don't know how much money he has compared to Cardi Brasson. We'll put him right about here. All right, we're going to get someone else in there. Let's have uh, Tony Frizzell. Tony Frizzell came from wealth, married wealthy. She suffered a lot of tragedies in her life early on. She lost uh, both of her brothers and her mother uh, early on in her life. And, um, you know, she really used that to say, I'm just going to focus on, on creativity. She did a lot of documentary work. Um, and again, very wealthy. So we're going to put her up here and that's as good a place as any. Let's talk about, where's somebody that's more moderate? We're going to talk about Carrie Mae Weems. Um, she would be more working class, middle class, uh, coming up, I believe. And I don't think she's become, you know, an uber wealthy artist, but she's well known, well respected. Her work is very introspective. And so she's going to be a more moderate, and we're going to put her right here. Uh, Ansel Adams was requested a lot. Ansel, Ansel Adams came from wealth. He had a lot of money. Uh, it'd be easy to say he wasn't a sad sack because he's photographing nature. But he was very judgmental of other photographers that didn't do uh, straight photography or a traditional style of photography. Uh, anyone who's doing things that were like pictorialism looked like paintings he was not having it so he you know that type of judgmental nature uh definitely goes into the sad sack territory a lot of anger is uh covering up sadness as we know so we're gonna put him right about there avidon again i don't know where he started exactly but he became one of the most prominent uh well-funded fashion photographers in the world so uh, he definitely came up into a lot of money. Again, uh, a, lot of, a lot of attitude, rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, but also, you know, a lot of people forgave him for it, calling it, you know, the, it's a part of their creativity. So we're going to put him uh, somewhere in here. Maybe I'll move uh, Ansel over a little bit here. Gregory Crudson, people love his photography, very moody. That's why it's in the sad sack area. He's got very, uh, you know, very expensive shoots. His work sells for a lot. Um, so, you know, he's, he's probably doing okay. We'll put him right about in here. Uh, let's talk about Lee Friedlander, street photographer. Um, but he didn't have the level of despair that a lot of street photographers had. He had a regular job for a long time shooting for Columbia Records, doing album covers and things like that. Uh, I almost put him into weird because he's a little quirky. I like that about him. Love his work. One of my favorite photographers. Um, so I'm going to put him right about here. He's doing, doing pretty good. Weston. Edward Weston. Again, another one. Came from a well-off background. Um, that's what allowed him to focus on photographing things like peppers uh, for hours on end. So I don't know just how far this way. Uh, we're just going to put him... Somewhere in here. Uh, Fan Ho, Chinese photographer based out of Hong Kong. Did a lot of work in the 50s and 60s. Street photography. Again, street photography skews, sad sack. But he was very, you know, artistic in his street photography. Um, so we're going to pull him more towards here. And uh, he became a film director. Uh, regarded, but, uh, you know, I don't know how much this way he needs to go. We'll just put him right about there. Uh, Flor Garduño, Mexican photographer, beautiful work, uh, very moody. Some of it skews more sad, some of it skews more weird. So we're going to put her kind of in the middle. Um, I think, you know, she had a lot of education and schooling in photography coming up. So that doesn't read uh, poor background to me. This is about the middle class area. Let's go there. 
Graziella Iturbide, another um, Mexican photographer. Love her work so much. Uh, her family was very wealthy, and uh, she had a daughter pass away at a young age, maybe nine or, or ten. Um, so that that sadness and uh, preoccupation with death really went into her work a lot. So we'll put her, you know, maybe somewhere around here. I might move Tony over a little bit. I think that's probably a good here. Let me preface this by saying mental health is a serious issue. Um, I'm not making light of this at all. Uh, we're just talking about photographers and what they, what they were like personality-wise and what their work was like. And so I think kind of the extreme end here is Deanne Arbus. Um, she came from a very wealthy family. She also suffered from depression and, um, you know, turned away from what her, her family's wealth was uh, and chose to photograph people who were outsiders because she herself felt like an outsider. Um, you know, she ended up taking her life in her early 40s. And uh, again, wonderful photographer. I love her work. I mean this with the utmost respect. Now, there is one spot you may have noticed throughout this series that we have not talked about yet, and that was right in the center here. So let's talk about who is in the middle. This is Sabine Weiss. I think she really converges on all of the things. She called herself a working photographer. She did come from probably an upper middle class upbringing, but she moved away from her family, started a career as a photographer, uh, earned her own money, earned her own living. Uh, and she would say like, you know, she was working, getting jobs, doing commercial photography, doing street photography in her spare time. Uh, she didn't have time to sit around and write books like people like Cartier Bresson, who could take jobs when they pleased and uh, didn't have to earn completely living from photography, even though I'm sure he did. Uh, he was very busy. So, and between that nature of, you know, documentary and uh, the humanist photography side of things, I just, to me, she feels like she fits right in the center of the graph here. So there we have it. We've got the whole thing here. The spectrum of photographers. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this series. And let me know if you have any questions or other photographers you're curious about. <laughs>